Hello everyone and welcome to RaceConf. This year is a little bit different and we cannot meet in Portland. I hope you still enjoy all the talks we recorded for you and thank you for watching my talk. I would like to start my talk today with a quote from Richard Feynman who was a famous physicist and even got a Nobel Prize in 1965. At the time of his death they found this quote What I cannot create I do not understand on his blackboard. But what did he mean with it? By building something from scratch, step by step, we will develop a firm understanding of the problem. Sometimes we have to admit that we do not understand something we thought we already do understand. And if we eventually succeed, it is the ultimate proof that we understood the problem at hand. Today we will build a performance monitoring tool from ground up which will help us to use these tools better in the future. My name is Christian Bruckmeier. You can find me on Twitter with at Bruckmeier or on my blog Bruckmeier.net. I live in the southwest of England in the beautiful city of Bristol and I work for Cookpad, an online recipe sharing application. Let's talk a little bit about performance monitoring. Performance monitoring helps us to spot and identify performance bottlenecks in our applications. Many of you probably use a software as a service platform like New Relic or Skylight. Today we will build a tool called Active Monitoring together, which will implement a subset of the features you know from New Relic or Skylight. Because we only have 30 minutes time, our implementation will only cover response time and database operation metrics. The tool will have three components, a Ruby on Rails plugin, a data storage and a dashboard for data visualizations. Everything what I present today is also published on my blog, so if something is a little bit too fast you can look it up on my blog article too. Most of the knowledge I present today is extracted from the InfluxDB RaceGem, which is an open source performance monitoring tool I maintain with a friend. Because we only have 30 minutes time today, we will not discuss how to actually spot and fix performance issues. If you're interested in this topic, I recommend to watch the talk from Nate Berkopek from last year's RaceConf. This talk is divided into four chapters. In our first chapter, we will start collecting data with the help of active support. After that, we will continue with storing, processing and visualizing of our collected data. As mentioned in the beginning, we will use Active Support to build our performance monitoring tool. And Active Support is a utility framework of Ruby on Rails. The more popular features of Active Support are the Ruby Core extensions. Some examples are the date and array extensions like from now to sentence or many. But Active Support does also ship with an instrumentation framework. You can imagine this a little bit like an event stream. So at the top we instrument an event with a name add, which has a payload um, containing a term and we will execute one plus one in the function block. And at the bottom we subscribe to this event add and every time the code at the top gets executed, the subscribe block gets executed as well. And in it we just log out the start and the payload of the term. Luckily Ruby on Rails already ships with more than 50 hooks into the framework, which helps us to extract metrics from our apps. A few events we will use today are the start processing event, which gets fired before a controller action gets executed. The process action event, which gets fired after a controller action was executed. An active record even provides an event for each SQL query, which gets executed. As a first step, I would like to re-implement this framework so we can see how it actually works. Let's start with a subscribe method. We need an, a class attribute notifier, which is an empty hash. And the subscribe method accepts a name and a block, which we will store in this hash. The instrument method also accepts a name and a payload. We store the time before we execute a block. We execute the block and then we store the time after we execute the block as well. And in the second step, we just iterate over, over all the callbacks we stored in the subscribe method and we call them uh, with a payload and merge into it the start and the finish time. 
As I already mentioned, Ruby on Rails already ships with more than 50 hooks into the framework. But sometimes this is not enough and we want to also instrument methods from external libraries like Redis or Memcache. In this case, we need to install a monkey patch and wrap the function into an instrument block, which we can later subscribe to. In this example, we just monkey patch the call method of the Redis library. In this chapter, we had a look at active support and its instrumentation framework. We now know which hooks Ruby and Rails already provides and we can use to extract data from our apps. In this chapter, we will implement the storage of the collected metrics. As a first step, we need to install the process action subscriber, which we do in a Ruby on Rails plugin. Plugins are a way to extend Rails and hook into its internals. The process action event payload provides us with this information. Initially, we will only extract the control and action name and the execution runtime. Later, we could also extend this to also store the response format, the method and the response status. With the information from the payload, we could build a table like this. We have an ID, a timestamp, and we can calculate the duration from the start and finish times of the event. We have the hook name, which is the name of the event, and the location is the controller and action name. So this looks a lot like a relational database. And most relational databases implement a create, read, update, and delete operation. And these operations map very good to our controller actions, which often have a create, show, update, and destroy action. But for the performance monitoring tool we are planning to implement, we don't really need all these operations. Of course, we need a create operation because we want to write our metrics to the database. But for each request, we will write many, many metrics to the database. We plan to write one metric for the response time and additionally metrics for each SQL queries. In the future, we might even extend this to include view render times or background jobs. We will of course read the data, but only timely related together. So we will read the metrics of the last three hours or the last 24 hours. We will almost never update any of the metrics. If a metric is persisted after execution of a controller action, we will never go back and change it because the response time won't change after it's written. Sometimes we will delete metrics, but this is more like a garbage collection. If you're only interested in the metrics for the last month, once a month we can run a background job to delete everything which is older. If we have a look how most relational databases are implemented, we will see that they use a data structure like a B tree or a B plus tree. And the B tree contains several pages uh, with the data and each page has pointers to the next page. If one of these pages is uh, getting too big, it's getting split in, in new pages, which also contain pointers to the new pages. Because we will write a lot of metrics, we would constantly need to create new pages and write to the disk. This wouldn't be very efficient. And in the last few years, a different type of database got very popular, which is called a time series database. So time series databases are nothing new. They already exist since 30 or 40 years, but mostly in the finance industry. One use case is if we want to track the uh, price of a stock over time, we could store this in a, in a time series database. And the reason why they got very popular in recent years is Internet of Things. We now have a lot of devices with sensors and we constantly run, want to write the results of these sensors, for instance, like a temperature or humidity. A few popular time series databases you might have heard about are InfluxDB, Prometheus or Graphite. For the rest of the talk, I will use now InfluxDB. If we have a look at the data schema in InfluxDB, we will notice that this is very similar to the schema in a relational database. Instead of tables, however, we have measurements. And each measurement has several metrics and each metrics 
has a timestamp which is the primary key. Additionally, we have fields, in this case it's the duration, and tags, in this case it's hook name and location. And the main difference between a field and a tag is the tags getting indexed and we can use them in filtering our metrics. Why are time series databases now better for high volume write applications? Instead of a B-tree, they use a data structure called a log-structured merge tree under the hood. A log-structured merge tree consists basically of two elements. The first element is a sorted tree in memory which accepts new writes. And whenever this tree is getting too big, we will dump it into a log file on disk. The log files on disk are also sorted by time and contain an index, so we can search them very efficient. If we search a metric in our database, we would first look into the memory tree and, and if it doesn't exist, we would iterate over all the log files on disk. The big advantage here is now that most time series databases already implement a retention policy, policy which does a garbage collection for us and deletes all log files. Additionally, it also takes care of compressing and downsampling the log files, which makes it more efficient than using a relational database. With this knowledge, we can now write the request metric to our influx database. We take the timestamp, we calculate the text, which is a hook name and the location, and we calculate the value, which is a finish time minus the start time. We also want to monitor the SQL queries, but before we can do that, we first need to clean, normalize and group the payload we will receive. We will do this in the next chapter. In this chapter, we had a look at the data structure of our metrics and which data storage would be the most efficient. We decided to use a time series database like InfluxDB in the end. In the third chapter, we will process the data received in the SQL event. Before we can store the data in the database, we will need to clean, normalize and group it. We will start with the normalization process. The payload we receive from Rails contains the SQL query and the name. If we have a look at the SQL query, we will notice that it does contain values. For analyzing the data, we need to remove these values and normalize the queries. This is necessary so we can group them together later. One approach we can do is using a regular expression to find and replace all values. As there are several different positions in an SQL query where values can occur, we will end up with several regular expressions too. It's also worth noting that there are different SQL dialects and we might need to adapt our regular expressions depending on the database we use. The next step is cleaning to remove unnecessary data which does not provide any value. Without the cleaning step, we will notice that we will also write SQL queries which are not executed in our Rails app but by active record in the background. Most queries from active record, like getting the version of the database or the schema version, we want to filter out because usually they won't cause any performance issues. There are also create and alter commands which are usually executed in migrations or tests. We also want to filter these out. We can build a query object which only tracks SQL commands we are interested in like select, insert, update and delete and also does not track uh, schema migrations. The last step of processing our data is grouping. We would like to see which queries get executed by which controller action to identify potential problems. The payload of the SQL query event, however, does not contain a request ID. The reason is that Active Record is a standalone framework and we can use it outside the request and response cycle, of course. We can use it by migrations, background jobs, or even without Rails. In the beginning, I showed that there's also a start processing event triggered at the start of each controller action. We can subscribe to the start processing event to fill a cache which we later read when storing the active record metrics. We use here current attributes which has a location and a request ID attribute. 
Current attributes is also implemented in active support, but we can easily implement it by ourselves by storing a hash in the current thread. And then implement getter and setter methods to store the key and value pairs in this hash. If we put everything together, we first check if we want to track this query. We then fetch the current location in request ID from our current attributes. We fetch the normalized query and then store everything in our InfluxDB. In this chapter, we had a look at cleaning, normalizing and grouping our data. The processing step is necessary, so our metrics provide more value and insights later on. The downside of this approach is that we will add some additional time to our response time. We could implement the normalization step in a C library or even move it out to a background job if this is a concern. In the last chapter of this talk, we will look into visualizing the collected metrics. But why is visualizing even necessary? If we have only a few metrics like here, we can easily spot that there is a problem with a third metric because it has a higher response time. But in a real world application, we would have thousands or even millions of data points and it would be impossible for us to spot any problems. If we visualize our metrics in a dashboard like here, we can see that most of our users have a response time between 16 and 60 milliseconds. But some of our users would even experience a response time of up to one second, which would be a big problem. So visualization of the metrics helps us to spot issues in our application. Some metrics we can calculate are, for instance, the average, which is the sum of all values divided by the number of values. In this case, it would be 105 milliseconds. Another useful metric is the median, which we can calculate by ordering all values and pick the one in the middle. In this case, it would be 56 milliseconds. And with the help of InfluxDB, we can easily calculate these metrics because it already implements mathematical functions. If we group our values in buckets and visualize it on a histogram, we will see that in a normal distribution, the median and average are close together. The response time of most web applications is not a normal distribution though. Most web applications have a lot of fast response times, but then also some really slow ones, for instance, for users with a lot of data. In this distribution, we see that the average and median are not similar and the average would give us the false impression of a response time of around 100 milliseconds. The median would be more accurate here, which tells us that most of our users have a respons response time of faster than 130 milliseconds. In this histogram, we can also see that 10% of our users even have a response time slower than 10 seconds. Richard Schneeman published a really good blog article about this topic, so if you're interested in this, I definitely recommend to check this out. Visualization also helps us to set the right priorities. We can calculate in which controller actions we spend the most time. In this table, we can see that we spend almost 50% of our time in the first action. That would be a good candidate for any performance improvements. The 80-20 rule tells us that often 80% of our time is spent in 20% of our controller actions. If we want to improve the performance of our application, we should focus on these 20% first, otherwise our effort could be wasted. Visualization not only helps us to spot performance problems, but also gives us an indication about what is causing these problems. We could, for instance, calculate the maximum and the median times of SQL queries, which could indicate that there is an index missing. And we can also count these SQL queries, which gives us an indication about n plus one queries or even missing memoization. In this chapter, we talked about visualization of our metrics and how it can help to spot issues, set priority for refactorings, and even give us an indication about the cause of any performance issues. Today, we build a performance monitoring tool step-by-step -step together. We started by collecting metrics from Ruby on Rails and stored them into a time series database. 
Some of the metrics we needed to clean, normalize and group first, which we discussed in the third chapter. Last but not least, we also visualize the data to spot potential performance issues. To build this tool, we heavily used open source software. We used the Ruby on Rails plugin, stored the metrics in InfluxDB and visualized the data on a dashboard with a Grafana. The big advantages are that we can customize the solution and bend it to our needs. We can collaborate with the Ruby on Rails community and share best practices and dashboards. To come back to the quote from the beginning, what I cannot create, I do not understand. By building a performance monitoring tool step by step, we now understand how its internals work, which also helps us to use these tools better in the future. As mentioned in the beginning, most of the knowledge in this talk is extracted from the InfluxDB race gem. We always look for new contributors and help, so if this talk made you curious about performance monitoring, you can find us on GitHub. This year I can't take your questions in person, but I'm very happy to take any questions. So feel free to send me a message on Twitter or an email, the at or christian at Thank you again for watching my talk.